Hello, everybody. I hope you all had a wonderful week. Let's set this up here one second. So I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for joining me today. I really have a bad case of classitis, speakeritis, so I so hope you'll bear with me today. We also have a new person. I'd like to welcome Matthew to our group. So let's begin with unmasking the demons in the kingdom of the heart. <clears throat> Uma gyana timarandasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshur unmilitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha siddhantot palasaranicharasikam hamsam vilhasatmikam Audaryakya Sudham Sevagadanam Vishrambha Bhakti Pradam Yachna Yuti Vichakshanam Dvagabido Vaishishta Shakya Sada Vandeham Dripurari Namakayatim Shri Bhakti Vedantinam Shri Guru Pamananda Premananda Palaprada Rajananda Pradananda Sevayamaniyo Jaya Namo Mahavadanyaya Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishnaya Krishna Jaitanya Namne Gortashe Namaha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchan Nagorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sutta Devi Prananami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhubya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Vaishnavas. <clears throat> well, welcome also to Kartik. So today is an incredibly auspicious day. For all Vaishnavas. During this series on unmasking the demons in the kingdom of the heart, we have been talking um, about Krishna and approaching him in an indirect way by hearing about his occasional leelas as opposed to his eightfold daily leelas. These occasional leelas, which hold for the sadhaka um, lessons as to what we need to leave behind as we embark on our journey of Raj Bhakti. I've read this before and I'll do it again because it's quite pertinent as to why we are approaching the leela in this way. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in his Sri Chaitanya Shikshamrita, he says, hearing the indirect pastimes of killing the demons, the devotee will be able to destroy the obstacles to tasting rasa. As a result, the material gunas will disappear and they will easily be able to attain Goloka. So by discussing Krishna's defeating of the demons, we'll be able to reflect on how these different demons got in the way of Krishna consciousness and how they are personified 
um, and might be found within our own selves. So last week, we spoke about King Kongsa, and uh, we learned that he defeated and brought under his reign all of the demons that we've ever heard of being connected with Krishna. And he created a great army that was powerful enough to defeat the demigods. And it is these demons that defeated the demigods who he sent one by one to kill baby Krishna. Kangsa, being the king of demons and the ruler of all of them, he's compared to misguided intelligence that gives more emphasis and value to reason than to um, revealed knowledge and experience itself. So, um, we can use our intelligence. We're not to forget our intelligence, but we are to use it to discern what's favorable and what is unfavorable for our practice. Today, we're going to talk about Putana. And Putana was the first demon to respond to Kongsa's call. So he had a LinkedIn account and he put a request out there and she was the first one to respond for the job. And she actually volunteered for the slaying of Krishna. She, Putana represents um, the false guru and this, having her come in the beginning of Krishna's pastimes, it really demonstrates how the false, having a proper guru um, is vital right from the get-go. So let's begin by talking about who Putana is, where she came from, what she's all about. So Putana, even just her name, Putana is connected with the word putrefaction, which is the process of decaying and rotting of, of the body. And um, the first signs of putrefaction is like the skin turns a greenish discoloration on the outside. And the abdominal wall is the first thing to go. So when we hear of Putana, we actually, you know, um, hear and think of these kind of demons, we often think of their skin being greenish and a sunken abdomen and things. So Putana is a is a appropriate name and putrefaction is a an appropriate term connected with Putana. In um, Sanskrit, the word putana is broken down into put, which means virtue, and na, which means no. So putana also means devoid of virtue. She's also connected um, with Ayurveda, and putana is the name of a weapon of the the goddess, the demigoddess, which is kind of sounds weird, but it's a goddess of smallpox. And the goddess of smallpox, her name is Sitala. And in one of her prior lives, Sita, Sitala is, connect, is known as the wife of Dronacharya, who was the guru, the military guru of both the Kauravas and the Pandavas. So She's the goddess of smallpox, and she's the wife of the teacher of military arts. I wonder if that is the origin of, you know, biological warfare. Anyway, that's just a joke. So back to the, the Ayurveda, there's a section in the Ayurveda called rituals, 
related to childhood. So all childhood diseases, according to this section, that fall on the third day of the third month of the third year of a child's life, they're attributed to Putina. And there's mention, um, all these diseases are mentioned in poisoned milk. So I found that quite interesting. Um, Putina is also portrayed as a bird sometimes in sculpture and images that are painted of her paint her as a bird. And some of the um, Puranas, I believe it's the Hari Vamsa Purana, they actually describe her as coming to Krishna as, as a bird. This might be connected to the fact that she has the ability to fly in the sky. So in her past life, this is very um, intriguing and it makes a whole lot of sense as to how Putina was able to enter Braj and why she did what she did. So in her past life, according to the Garga Samhita and also the Brahmavarta Purana, they tell of Putana as being Ratnamala. Ratnamala was the daughter of the demon king Bali. And um, when she saw Vamana, um, Vamana Dev, she felt a desire to have him as her son and to actually nurse him. He was so beautiful that she was just naturally attracted to him and all and motherly affections just poured out of her. And uh, she, she thought, if I had a son like him, then I would give him that gloriously smiling son, the milk from my breast to drink. In that way, my heart would become happy. So the personality of Godhead, Lord Vamana gave his blessing in his heart to the daughter of his great devotee, Bali Maharaj. May your desire be fulfilled. However, we know that's not the end of the story because Vamana Dev overpowered her father and took his acquisitions and pushed him into the lower planetary systems. So she had a change of heart and then she wanted to actually kill Vamana Dev. So Krishna knew her desires then too and allowed her to fulfill both of them, to suckle him and to attempt to take his life. So Krishna is absolutely perfect. Putana is a special kind of witch. Like I had mentioned, she can fly in the sky and this is called a Ketchari witch. In Krishna book, Krishna gives, I mean, Srila Prabhupada gives the detail that they can transfer themselves from one place to another on the branch of an uprooted tree. This time of year, at least in the US, there's a lot of tribute to this kind of witch flying on a broomstick. This is a good example of how we carry on traditions without any knowledge about what they mean or where they came from. Some place the origins of modern, the modern Putana Halloween mashup, see it as um, beginning with the Druids, you know, a millennia ago. Halloween is known as the time of lifting the veil. It is lifting the, the divider between the material and spiritual worlds, or perhaps more accurately, between the gross and subtle aspects of life, or the light and dark, the shadow sides of life. When this veil is thin, it's easier to recognize, to unmask, and to bring to light our attachments to things, thoughts, ideas, and concepts that lurk beneath the surface and hold us back from our progress 
with thick chains that are of no value to us in our spiritual pursuits. So this is just a, a common thought um, that that people have, and it it there is some some truth to it. Another mashup taking you know ancient ancient teachings from the from the Puranas and things and mashing it into contemporary thought is during the the witch hunts. I found some really uh, interesting things. I mean, just just think of how they used to, you know, when they thought that a person was a witch, they would burn them. And that's actually what happened after Putina died. They um, cremated her. So that's an interesting similarity. And um, before the 1400s, the Europeans generally believed in, in magic and with witchcraft. It wasn't um, such a, an odd thing or, or a big deal, but there wasn't like a consensus as to what witches do and what magic is. It, it varied from place to place. There was no, you know, pan-European agreement on, um, on who witches were and exactly what they did. However, at one point across Europe, um, there began to be a recounting from place to place that had very, very similar um, elements to them. So one was that they murdered children. And the other one was that they rode on wooden implements. And those implements were smeared, sorry to say, um, with flight enabling ointment that was made of the fat of the murdered baby. Oh, that's so gross. But anyway, it's very similar to what we know um, about Putina. And they traveled by night to secret gatherings. And it is claimed in the Puranas that Putina had to, had to go at night when she was in her, her witch form. She had to travel at night. So the concept of witches, it continued throughout the, the great hunt era of European witch trials. And it persists somewhat in a much friendlier image of the witches that we have today, you know, riding on broomsticks, hanging from people's trees outside with little uh, spider webs and, and spiders. So where these, these stereotypes came from, their scholars have, have looked into this and they pointed to um, friars who in the early 1400s were traveling from village to village, town to town, all over, trying to find heresy. They were trying to combat heresy. So they gathered bits and pieces from these different places, different fears that they had, and scooped them all together and molded them nicely into um, demonology. So I, I can't help but wonder if they happened to, you know, bump into somebody who had been to India or if some of them had gone to India and had learned the stories about Putina and had gotten the descriptions about her because they are so similar. So there was actually even a book written um, by a German Catholic inquisitor. <clears throat> and uh, basically it was a dummy's guide to witch killing. And this book sold more than any other book for 200 years, except the Bible. So people were uh, really into this. So you must be wondering, why in the world am I bringing this up? Well, it gives us some context. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, um, he was born in 1838. And 
he came on the heels of what's known as the age of enlightenment or the age of reason. And that's a time that was marked by an emphasis on scientific method and reductionism. And they questioned the um, religious orthodoxy and they were working very hard to put to rest, you know, um, stories from religion and superstition. They argued um, for a society that was based upon reason, like it was an ancient Greece, rather than faith and doctrine. They wanted a new civil order that was based on natural law and for science based on experiments and observations. Um, it, was, it didn't only happen in Europe. Bengal itself had its own renaissance and Bhaktivinoda Thakur was actually a member of the intellectual community that was attempting to rationalize their traditional Hindu beliefs and customs. So superstition and religious mumbo jumbo was scoffed at and it was considered irrelevant. So this is what Bhaktivinoda Thakur was up against. How to present the Krishna philosophy and Krishna Leela as real and not just more religious superstitious mumbo jumbo, especially when you have descriptions of demons that almost exactly match those that are targeted as ridicule. If you believed them, then you're simply a fool. So how to legitimize Gaudiya Vaishnavism in the Western mind? How he had to think how to reconcile Western reasoning and traditional belief. This could not have been an easy task. So if we find that he may have um, de departed in some areas to explain things in a, in a particular way, according to his time, his place and his circumstance that might um, be different from the seminal acharyas, we should not be surprised. We should actually be surprised if he didn't do that. He wouldn't be doing a service to humanity if he just repeated um, what was classically there. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur created a, a metaphorical door that would lead, lead the thinkers of the time the transcendental realm without them even knowing it. Bhaktivinoda compared Putana to the false guru, to someone that looks good on the outside, but is rotten to the core. Putana dressed like a devotee, but she harbored ill intent. <clears throat> she cut the profile disguising herself as one of the highest devote devotees of Krishna, even higher than Yashoda and Rohini. This also represents how we can poison ourselves, our bhakti, with selfish motivations to dress up like, you know, we dress up our devote, our personal motivations as, a, as an element of bhakti. So this takes the form of hypocrisy. During ancient Greek times, <clears throat> the word was used in the realm of drama. <clears throat> it wasn't um, <clears throat> anything sinister to it. It was it just meant to play a part or to pretend. And in the 12, 1200s, however, the hypocrisy was considered to be the sin. Now it's demonized. It's the sin of pretending 
to have a virtue or goodness. <clears throat> the word hypo, excuse me, <clears throat> actually it has roots in Sanskrit. We're familiar with it because Gurmaraj explains it many, many times. It it's, comes from upo or upanishad, which means to draw near. It also means to go up from under. And the word, the part of hip, hypocrisy, the word kriya, that part means to sieve, to sift. So it also means to discriminate or distinguish. So Putana had to discriminate and distinguish what were devotional qualities and to be able to imitate them as if she was bringing them out from within herself. Biting hypocrisy seems to be a, a common occurrence across religious traditions. And oftentimes it's the religious institution itself that is accused of being hypocritical. The mystic branch of that tradition um, has a tendency to expose the falsities, the hypocrisies of those claiming orthodoxy. We can see how it's easy to not be able to walk the talk. If the talk is etched in stone, if it is not dynamic, if it does not change over time, if it is not applied according to the time, place, and circumstance. There's a section in um, the Bible called the seven woes of the Pharisees. And it's here that Jesus portrays the Pharisees as, as impatient and with outward ritual observance of minutia, which made them look acceptable and made them look virtuous outwardly, but inside they were not actually um, reforming. So this reminds us of the, the Brahmanas who in Krishna Leela, they were so wrapped up in performing their Vedic rituals or Vedic sacrifices, which are meant to actually feed Vishnu, but they couldn't set that aside and recognize that he was right there be before him. So this it's insidious and it's hard to recognize ourselves. So hypocrisy, it's also been a favorite topic of psychologists and philosophers. Uh, Carl, Carl Jung, he attributed hypocrisy to those who are not aware of the dark or shadow side of their nature. And that's exactly what we are talking about in this, in this series. So this is what he said, and it really sums it up well. It is under all circumstances an advantage to be in full possession of one's personality. Otherwise, the repressed elements will only crop up as a hindrance elsewhere, not just at some unimportant point, but at the very spot where we are most sensitive. If people can be educated to see the shadow side of their nature clearly, it may be hoped that they will also learn to understand and follow their fellow men and love their fellow men better. A little less hypocrisy and a little more self-knowledge can only have good results in respect for our neighbor, for we are all too prone to transfer to our fellows the injustice and violence we inflict upon our own natures. So the more we are self-aware of our own unwanted tendencies. Actually, the less we are prone to commit offenses, 
towards others. Hypocrisy is also related to self-deception. They're intertwined. And in many studies <clears throat> over the decades, it's been found that in everyday reasoning, we do very little to get real evidence when taking positions or making decisions. And we do even less to get evidence for opposing positions. Instead, we tend to fabricate you know, um, pseudo evidence. And we do that even after the decision has already been made. We take a position, we look for evidence that supports it, and then we find some evidence enough so that our position makes sense. And then we stop thinking. When pressed to produce real evidence, <clears throat> we tend to seek and interpret evidence that confirms what we already believe. It's this pattern is demonstrated so clearly these days, which is, you know, Kali Yuga is the age of hypocrisy. And it is certainly unfolding before our very eyes in the media and also um, specifically on Facebook. I, I can't help but think of the discourses and the comments and replies to Padmanabha Maharaj's um, podcasts about non-inherency of bhakti. You can see these patterns totally um, play out. And it's also been shown in studies that the more <clears throat> one can conceal their true feelings and intentions, the greater ability we have to deceive others. So if you really, really, really believe what you're saying, it's going to be harder to, to give that up. Putina, with the help of Yoga Maya, she had this down to an art form, um, really concealing her true feelings and intentions. She, it's mentioned, I've read several, several um, accounts of Putina entering Brudge, and all of them stress that she was so beautiful. She was so beautiful that they thought the goddess of fortune herself had come there. And she smiled so beautifully and showed so much love toward Krishna that Yashoda and Rohini and all the other nurses, they had absolutely no reason to doubt that she was not what she appeared to be. So this self-deception, it's also um, linked to self-ignorance. Um, ignorance, think of that word, it's to ignore, ignore, and that's the things that we ignore in ourselves. We're very good at challenging the beliefs of other people, but when it comes to our own beliefs, we tend to protect them and not challenge them. However, in spiritual life, this is the very thing that needs to be done again and again, continually. We are going to hear teachings through our material filters. We're going to misunderstand. We're going to misunderstand a lot of it. We don't know the language. We don't know the nuances. And we we have to fit all of that stuff into our head in relation to what's already there. We come with a particular conceptual framework. And it is only natural that when we hear things, we fit that in to the framework that's already there. It's normal, but we should be aware of it. And be willing to blow the framework up 
when misconceptions are pointed out to us. So to do this, we need association, ongoing association that can fine tune our ideas. That's what Sadhu Sangha is all about. It's bumping up against each other. You know, we have words like, oh, he rubbed me the wrong way. So what does that mean? He rubbed me the wrong way. That is, it's getting rid of those sharp edges. It's rounding us out so that we can become more flexible and, and more accepting um, to change our beliefs. And although there are aspects, relative aspects of the presentation of tattva, and actually tattva itself is relative, these relative aspects are not false. What is false is the accepting relative aspects as absolute principles. That falsity, that will get us in a tangled heap of misconception. If someone thoughtfully presents ideas that are different from those we currently hold, and what they say is reasonable and it properly is represented with support from scripture. And I say properly as opposed to not cherry picked to support what the agenda that they want to put forward. We should discard our ideas that we have and embrace new understanding. It's exciting. This is what keeps our growth dynamic. Accepting and eliminating is what makes progress. It will be helpful to look at ourselves, to be aware of what falsities we are disguising as truth and what false values we are investing in in order to maintain our temporary sense of self. It's our duty as students to think critically about how we are applying ourselves to our practice and we should have no fear. Devotional service in Krishna consciousness is so sublime. Even a little service rendered to Krishna knowingly or unknowingly, gives one the greatest transcendental benefit. Putana did not offer Vedic mantras before she made an offering, but automatically Krishna sucked her milk. In Krishna book, Srila Prabhupada says that even the entity who provided the article for the offering, the tree, the flower, the plant, they also get benefited indirectly. So what to speak of fledgling devotees who want to become free of misconceptions and false values so that they can develop love for Krishna, so that they can serve the guru purely in his or her service. So hearing about these demons, applying the lessons that they hold to our own lives, surrendering these unwanted things to Krishna, it's surely the way to rid us of the poison and material misconceptions. From the Srimad Bhagavatam, it says, any person who hears with faith and devotion about how Krishna the Supreme Personality of Godhead killed Putana and thus, and who thus invests, invests, right? His hearing in such childhood pastimes of Krishna certainly attains attachment for Govinda, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So now I'm going to... Um, 
do as I said. I'm going to read about Krishna killing Putana. This will be from the um, Gopal Champu. And I apologize ahead of time, preemptively, to the Spanish speaking devotees. Um, it is a lot for a translator to have to keep up with. So I apologize to both my dear friend, the translator, and my friends who have to suffer through this. <laughs> so one moment. Okay, a little place of where Putana comes in the time of Krishna's life. After um, the appearance of Yoga Maya in the prison of King Kongsa, um, if you remember, he um, Yoga Maya was born. Kongsa tried to kill her by smashing her on the ground, but instead she rose up in the sky and said, ah, Kongsa, you're such a fool. The one who is going to kill you, he has already been born and he is somewhere else. So after hearing this, Vasudev um, was very worried because now he knew that Krishna was in danger because Kangsa was going to send his evil hordes out across the land to find and kill all the babies that I believe were 10 days old and younger. So Vasudev, he sent a messenger. He had his own people still in the, in the kingdom. So he sent a messenger to Nanda Maharaj and had him tell Nanda Maharaj everything that had just transpired. Um, how Devaki had had a daughter and how Kongsa tried to kill her and how he didn't do that and how he's sending his evil hordes. So Vasudev suggested through the messenger that Nanda Maharaj, in order to take any kind of, um, so that Kongsa wouldn't look at him, that he should go to Matora and just smother Kongsa with taxes, pay a tribute to Kongsa, and therefore it would diminish the um, suspicion that Krishna might be with Nanda Maharaj. So Nanda Maharaj, he conferred with his brothers and they agreed that Vasudev was, was uh, correct, but it was an intelligent thing to do. So while Nanda Maharaj was in Matura delivering um, taxes and also wanting to meet up with Vasudev and, and hear more about what's going on there to see how he is. Um, then the murderous Putana, she was traveling city to city, town to town, and the cowherd villages making a menacing rumbling sound as she, you know what, murdered babies. Now there's one quick thing I wanted to add here. Another thing Putana, in addition to her in her prior life, having had association with Vamanadev and wanting him as her child. Also in this life, Putana was not able to kill the children in the places where they were talking about Krishna or they were talking about Vishnu. The only babies she was able to kill were those who were inimical to Krishna. So in a roundabout way, she actually, by Yoga Maya's arrangement, ended up um, serving Krishna. So she had this other um, accidental service in, in her favor. This is from the Gopal Champu. 
When Putina entered the village, she took a form like a pot ornamented with gold bells, hiding her nature as a snake. Her breasts were covered with tears and flowed with milk. In this way, she bewildered the two women, Rohini and Yashoda. With choked voice, she said, oh, Yashoda, you have become very hard because of many duties. Therefore, Rohini, with steady affection for your son, has been a great benefit. Keeping the tender child on the bed, you must carry out many duties, and you do not pay full attention to this child. One keeps the life air in the heart. What to speak of keeping this child dearer than the life air itself in your heart? Your hearts have become hard like those of demons. Hmm, that sounds like a, a tactic. As Lakshmi, by my extraordinary powers, I have heard about this son and have come immediately. Just as the jasmine becomes joyful in spring, in the same way, my eyes become joyful on seeing this child. My breasts spreading auspiciousness everywhere are flowing with nectar. If the child drinks this nectar, he will attain a perfect body. I will become his nurse and I will give him happiness. Shnigdakanta said, what happened when she took the child? Madhukanta, taking the child by trickery, the poisonous Putana put his lotus mouth on the tip of her breast. With fear, Shnigdakanta said, then what happened? Marikanta spoke with a laugh. On seeing this evil she-demon in place of his mother, Krishna purified her of her milk and the faults of her body by the power of his anger, which kills. Because of the slight resemblance of a motherly attitude in her, he adopted a sweet attitude as if spreading perfume over her body and then sucked her milk with anger. Just as the Ganga purifies the water from the Kar Karmanasha River, the milk from Putana's breast became purified by Krishna drinking it. Yelling, let go of me! In great pain, she freed herself from her life's heirs she was able to pull Krishna from her chest since she had been purified. Leaving drudge like a flying bird, she gave up her body. Seeing this, everyone thought, some terrible sound has arrived in Brudge. Going to the place, they saw that Putana had assumed her natural form. Oops. Are you all still there? I just got a message that I was signed out. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. I got a message I was signed out because my account has been signed into from another device. Anyway, I shall continue. <clears throat> Taking the child who was holding onto her chest, she flew in the air. The life heirs of the two mothers also quickly flew away from the lotus of the, their bursting heart. If the two mothers had not fainted when the child was taken by Putana, how would they have been able to endure the situation? They could not, they would have died. Making a deafening clamor, the elders and middle-aged women ran here and there, leaving Yashoda and Rohini. Some, by good fortune, saw Putana, huge like a mountain, fall from the sky. Without fear, they approached and climbing on her arms, which were like a bridge, they took Krishna, who was playing fearlessly on her chest. 
Out of excitement, they ran quickly to the house without looking back. The women came to the great inner chambers with many following behind. They had seen the event and with joy and unsteadiness came there leaping and jumping. They saw Yashoda and Rohini unconscious and became completely bewildered what, about what to do. After a few moments, when all methods failed to revive them, one old intelligent woman placed the child in their laps. When this happened, their life heirs returned by the nectar of the child's presence. Seeing the child, they again fainted in bliss. They, re they then returned to consciousness, but wept as if moistening the dry summer earth. When they saw the child, tears fell from their eyes like iron needles, giving them the same pain they had experienced before. The tender child was brought so that he could drink their milk. Thus, the two women gradually became steady. They embraced the child, looked at him, kissed him, and smelled his head. They placed him on the ground and performed arti. Putana truly existed, and this child, he still exists. They clearly established this. The two mothers, without fear, began to see Krishna as the subduer of Putana. On returning to Braj, Nanda and others saw from afar the corpse of Putana. In loud voices, they discussed amongst themselves as follows. We cannot see the form clearly because of so many crows flying about. It has turned to ashes by the rays of the hot sun. It is funny because of many joints sticking out. It's decorating part of this huge, thick forest. It appears like a cloud stuck to the earth from far off. We should think of Vasudev's warning about future disturbances in Braj. Perhaps it is a mountain whose wings Indra cut off, which regained its wings and then fell here. Speculating in many ways, on seeing directly the body of the she-demon, they showed fear, humor, and curiosity. After a few moments, she, some came close and described it. Doubts were resolved and reality dawned on them. That dreadful form which had appeared nearby spread fear in all hearts. They understood that the body of Putana had fallen in Braj. Hearing that Putana had taken his child and that the child killed her, Nanda fainted, but immediately came to consciousness. He was like a person who, bitten by a snake, quickly applies special mantras to save himself. With amazement, he heard, saw, and experienced everything. First, he heard Putana's body fell down and spread spread out for 12 miles. The body was 12 miles wide and six miles high. She fell outside of Brudge. Her length could be covered. Oops. In two praharas, which means I had a note, but disappeared, three hours. So, the, her length could be covered in six hours, walking in one direction, and with her width could be covered by walking three hours in the other direction. No living beings except trees were harmed. He then saw the body on the orders of Upananda and others, persons of lower birth quickly cut up the body, which was spread out with bones as hard as thunderbolts using hard axes. They piled the pieces up in one place and carefully burned it. One cannot describe the strength of the people, such as leather dealers and blacksmiths living outside the abode of Brudge, what to speak of the strength of those within Brudge. And he experienced as follows. 
One does not attain the sweetness of Krishna even after many millions of yugas, but Putana, though wanting to kill him, on touching Krishna's body became most fragrant. The fragrant smoke of her body was like a messenger. When others entered the village on other days, they were attracted by the smoke. Nanda quickly went to the village to see Krishna. When he approached, his body was soaked in tears. He remained standing for some time, his arms held by his friends. Most sober Nanda regained control and surrounded by a few friends, went to the raised platform in a large courtyard and sat on the throne. Then his wife came with many close friends, took the child held by Upananda's wife in her own arms and placed him in the lap of Nanda. Thinking the child had perhaps been tormented in the night by some ghosts, he looked at the child who was like the full moon. Tasting the beauty of his form, drinking the pleasing nectar of his face, Nanda experienced an indescribable touch of happiness without compare. He experienced the fragrance of the head of his dark, tender son and astonished the whole universe with his bliss. So my friends, this is what awaits us. Putana representing hypocrisy and false guru can be easily vanquished by remembering this pastime and by calling out our mantra for this series, Krishna, Krishna, save me from this terrible demon. So are there any questions or corrections to what I have given today. Okay, my quiet friends, I hope you have a wonderful time, a wonderful day. Did you have something, Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu? Uh, not really. I just wanted to say something because I don't know. It's nice to hear your see voice. You. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes you can feel like you're in space on that end. So I'm just saying. Absolutely. I showed up today because I had a day off work and I was glad. I didn't even know who I was coming to, but this is a cool topic and I appreciated your well-researched uh, subject. Thank you. Yeah, I realized my classes are more like book reports given in oh. school than they are, you know, going to Vaishnav discussions. So that's no, where I'm, that that's I, where I'm that, at. I thought it was nice uh, to have mm -hmm. the extra uh, stuff. I thought it was a Gaudiya Vaishnav thing and a book report. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I do kind of like it also because when we see things in our modern world, now I bet every single one of you, when you see a witch now that is up for Halloween, you know, decorating someone's yard. I, I think you're going to think of Putana and this pastime and then the false guru and hypocrisy. And so, yeah, that's why I do it. That's quite a sum scar you've given us. You know, <laughs> well done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful week. And uh, thank you. Banjikalpa to Rupiash Chaka, the Sindhubi Eva Chapa Titanam Pavane, Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namun Namaha. Bhakti Ras, I'm going to give you a quick, a quick shout out before I go. Okay. Uh, it was a great class. I, I dropped off this girl, Marsh called me in the middle of it, so I had to go, but I would have been there throughout otherwise. And I especially like the thing that you. Um, the, what you did with the tying the Halloween and the like witch hunts and stuff to Bhakti Vinod and how he was trying to like present Gaudiya Vaishnavism without the, um, I guess the, what's the word? Uh, I can't find the word now, but like that's kind of like magical thinking or something. And uh, it was very creative. I was, I was definitely impressed by that. So excellent class and thank you very much and looking forward to hearing thank the next you. one next week. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.
Allez, beau.